Welcome to Life on Plato's Cave. I am Mario Vey. This is episode 25, Conversation Analysis with Mike Huiskus. In Plato's Cave, the prisoners fail to see the most everyday stuff. They simply don't notice it, even though it's all around them. It's a common theme in philosophy that that which is most pervasive and ever-present is actually most difficult to see and to think about. And what is more common than language? In fact, I am using it right now. What is language? How does it work? It's hard to even know where to begin. Our guide through Plato's cave today is Mike Huiskes. He's a professor of language and social interaction. And in our conversation he says that we do not really know how communication works. That's pretty strange, especially if you look at all the communication courses and all the language models around you. But I agree, language is a miracle. We really have no idea how it works. We'll speak about an approach to studying language and social interaction that has some surprising and fundamental insights, and that allows us to study language scientifically, even improving practical situations. But this approach, called conversation analysis, is very young. It only started in the 1960s. Mike Huiskes is professor of language and social interaction at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. His work focuses on social interaction as an embodied phenomenon in both mundane and professional settings. He studies topics like intersubjectivity, so how we relate to each other, Epistemics, so who makes claims about knowledge, how do we deal with knowledge in interaction, and action coordination. Currently his work focuses on learning and teaching as action coordination in various professional settings. For instance, studying how surgeons, supervisors and residents construct a learning environment. Could you start perhaps by just giving us a preview of the kind of work you do, the kind of research that you do? Uh, sure, I, um, I work in conversation analysis, which means that I uh, record conversations, uh, transcribe them uh, in uh, all their multimodal and embodied richness, so with including uh, gaze, gesture, body posture, etc. And, uh, and then, then try to analyze human uh, human interaction um, and I do this in everyday settings but also in in, in professional uh, in professional settings so in professional setting that I'm currently working most in is in in health and health education so for example um, learning and teaching in the in the operating theater and I'm interested in how people shape and constitute social reality using visible signs, so speech and all types of embodied embodied gestures. I know this because we sometimes work together, <laughs> <laughs> but a large, large part of your work is, is watching videos, uh, listening to recordings of, yeah, sometimes everyday interactions, sometimes professional interactions. And then with the transcript, uh, together you analyze, yeah, it in great detail, so to speak, right? Yeah. So I think I work from the from the assumption that language isn't just used to describe the world, uh, which is of course well known within fields like pragmatics and uh, conversation analysis. But we we act within the world, so we uh, we not only describe, but we uh, invite, request, insult, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We teach. So we perform actions using linguistic signs, where with linguistic, I mean this whole embodied system of, uh, of visible signs. And for me, the nice thing is that uh, for each and every action, you have multiple ways to do this. So uh, there's this one quote in our field, which says that languages uh, do best what users do most. And that sort of suggests that... Uh, the language system, 
the linguistic system, the interactional system has evolved as sort of optimal solutions for recurring everyday problems. So you want to do an action. So you want to invite someone and then your culture provides you with multiple practices to constitute that action. And I work from the assumption that each and every practice is, is different and has different effects so that they are there because they have different functions. And then of course you can ask the, the question, well, wherein lies that, that difference? What are these consequences? And then for example, in professional vision or, or professional context, you can uh, ask yourself if you're doing, for example, an instruction in a professional context and you have these different practices to constitute this so what are the what are the effects and the different meaning potentials of doing this action in those particular ways so you then can study uh, interactional practices from a from a functional perspective and ask what types of commu recurring communication problems they they try to solve or are used are used to solve. It's quite funny that we have this whole technical language and what you what you say already is quite, you know, you use a lot of words like embodied and, and all those kind of things, but actually it's about the most everyday stuff, right? Like, could you pass me uh, the, the knife in, in <laughs> or yeah, probably there's a technical term for it, but, or, or do you want to come to my party? And how do you respond? So it's it's a whole science and system that is actually studying. We're not studying black holes or we're not studying rare animals or something like that or climate change. But we're studying just, yeah, like you and me are sitting here talking uh, in different contexts. Yeah. So I think without the technical language, we study social beings and how they constitute their social world. So in your social reality, you build relationships, you perform actions. Uh, sometimes uh, you want to invite or direct other people to uh, to perform actions. And, and and that's that's what we study, sort of the 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 solution that our culture has evolved to to achieve this. And then of course you can also compare between languages. But for example, if you want to do something that happens quite often uh, like a request or an offer for example you want to offer someone a cup of coffee you can do that at, in 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 multiple ways you can use uh, verbal signs so you can ask you would you like a cup of coffee but you can also just hold up a cup of coffee and have the other person uh uh infer what you, what you mean right so you would do the the, the same offer then in a in an embodied way and of course if you look at sort of verbal offers you have multiple and multiple ways to offer someone a cup of coffee and your choice for that particular practice so the way you do this offer will have uh, consequences for uh, the way the other person will will respond the type of relationship you propose or assume that you have with that that person so uh Social reality is constituted by actions of people. They have different ways of doing these these actions, and the choice for these actions are are consequential in the sense of the type of reality you build or the type of professional goals you you achieve. And we try to analyze that in as as much detail as possible. So, beginning our analyses, we do not exclude anything as having a meaning potential. So we look into eye gaze. We look into pauses we look into rate of speech we look into loudness so we really take an uh, an inductive approach to uh, the study of language so we we see what type of categories sort of come out of the data rather than look at the data from a sort of uh, viewpoint of pre-existing categories yeah one of my colleagues when she learned about the way we do research, she compared it to a biologist. You you start by looking. You're not starting with already in your... Sometimes you can do that too, but in general, you don't have this specific thing. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at that. You just start with a piece of data, which is uh, already interesting to you, usually. 
And then you start looking at, oh, what's happening here? And just kind of describing, understanding, like a bio biologist, just looking what patterns do I see? Uh, what Are they maybe related to the day and the night? And uh, yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, so this, um, at least in my choice for becoming part of this field, that, that whole sort of natural history perspective of the, the 19th century of going into a forest and finding new species that you didn't know exist really, really appealed to me. So a lot of the work I also do with professionals is just carefully look at what they are doing and then asking them whether they were aware <laughs> of the fact that they are doing doing that right so you're there there is this element uh of discovery that uh, that greatly appeals to me yeah hmm. this perspective that you're describing it's not that old and like i said we we work together sometimes so i know you a little bit but i don't really know actually your history how did you come into this field how did you get to be interested in uh in language do you maybe remember the first time in your life that you really because we all use language all the time and you as a child you learn language but did, do you remember a moment where you thought hey language is actually a, a thing i can ask questions about or have opinions about yeah i think most kids are are quite quite aware of uh aware of this and and they're actually uh well at the fairly very early stage you you find out that language worked in a very indirect manner. So children at a certain point uh, will find out that you, uh, for example, if someone asks you, can you pass me the salt? You you can then say yes and, and treat it as a yes, no question. And they find that that hilarious at a certain age. And I think <laughs> uh, uh, child, all children are uh, aware of this. And then somehow it becomes so, so natural uh, that that you forget about it. So my my own son, when he was was four, I said O, oh, and then he asked me, "Is this a is this a surprised O or an angry O?" So he already distinguished between Multiple, <laughs> different uh, ways of O's. verbalizing yeah. it. Yeah, and I think in my own in my own personal history, uh, if you're looking for an anecdote, then uh, I I think I was always interested in the way people use behavior to to frame frame relationships. In the sense that uh, even when I was, uh, for example, as a very small boy uh, watching soccer games with my, my father, I would be very interested at, well, I, I guess it wasn't analyzing, but observing how people would behave after they scored a goal, who would hug whom and what that might tell about uh, their relationships. And I would go on and on about this up to the point where my father just forbade me <laughs> to speak. <laughs> so... But I think this whole insight that uh, that the meaning that of course there is meaning in, in in words and you shouldn't discard that and there is meaning in in grammar and that's very important uh, as well and you can give that numerous names you could call that literal meaning although I don't uh, I don't like that term but I guess people have sort of an intuition about what you mean if you use that but. Uh, so that that is not the meaning of of the sentence is something that I think children are very aware of at a certain age, and then you lose track of that, and then we actually have quite a hard time explaining this to our eighteen year old uh, students, where we have, for example, have simple sentences like uh, "My bike is broken," mm -hmm. which has, of course, a literal meaning to use that term, where that the bike of the speaker at a certain time is broken but it has also an, an interactional meaning or an action meaning so if uh, someone hits you with a car you can say well my bike is broken and it's it's an accusation or you can enter a seminar room late and you can say well my, my bike is broken and it's and it's an excuse and so that whole system how you get from these visible signs, which might be verbal or uh, more conceptual, grammatical or uh, extra linguistic, like gestures, how you all use all these signs to get to the action meaning. That's that's what interests me and uh, and my colleagues. So we want to make that type of knowledge explicit. 
there's so much implicit. I like this example of you you come in you come late somewhere at an appointment. You say you say your bike is uh, oh my bike is broken. It's an I think it's an example. Everybody knows what you mean <laughs> at that uh, point, but. Uh, I think one of the ways in which why this perspective is so diff uh, so difficult to grasp is because when we because we all use language, but we also have kind of an informal theory about language and how it works, and and you have to have it because you you know in misunderstandings and everything, everybody who can speak language also has an idea of how language works, but I think this idea of how language works is for a large part based on, of course, the education system, but also reading, reading books, a lot of texts or, or watching movies. And if you look, for instance, at the dialogue in a book or in a movie, that's not how people speak. <laughs> and they, and in a book, you need to do that because the readers are not there in that situation. But you, if you're there in the situation, you can... Yeah, use one word and probably the but the better you know each other now your son knows which kind of o means that you're angry or surprised so yeah my bike is broken and people don't say uh i'm sorry i realized that i'm late for this meeting but my bike is broken and because of that uh, this whole story you don't have to tell that you just say my bike is broken yeah, and it's, I, I guess what you say is uh, is very true in the sense that you you really well you don't even live in the world, but you are of the world. So everything we do is embedded in a in a physical embodied context, and the the sort of well, let's call it information, although that's not a nice term, but uh, that is sort of transmitted in every situation it is 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 huge. Or uh, so for I'm at the moment also studying joint activities, so just people working together. So I have students record. Uh, well, they are making their beds together with someone else, or they're uh, hanging up balloons, or digging a hole, any anything of sort of uh, everyday joint joint activities and uh they are really really rich events in their own right so if you and then if you then think about learning for example workplace learning uh which is really driven by this activity right so if you're a surgeon you cannot learn your trade from a book you have to really participate from the start and if you tr try to get sort of a hold on what is transmitted there, how sort of these new professionals are constituted and transformed in the activity is uh, is amazing. So for example, we, we all learn how to walk, uh, well, maybe with our parents holding our hands and, uh, but the parents really teach, the parents is really teaching you quite a few things beside walking so you he will sort of scaffold you so that you can keep your balance but in his stride he will also sort of uh teach you what is uh, an, a normal tempo to walk the the size of your uh, of your steps right so the the the, the information that is that is transmitted is, is really what you really, do with your arms exactly uh, what you do if yeah. somebody else passes by do you say yeah. hi or not and uh, well that that, that, that even uh, yeah that as well and I, I think the reason we uh why it's so uh difficult to once you are sort of a competent uh user of language it's it's very difficult to, to get back to that stage of wonder so it's yeah, yeah, yeah in that sense it's different from uh studying natural natural history right because if you're studying migration patterns of uh, some tropical frog people sort of know well that you need to do that you don't know how this works and you need to to study this to understand it but everyday language is so natural to us that it takes quite a bit of work also with our students and in our research to to make that strange again so you can can ask questions and wonder how this how this is possible we, because we are such wonderful interpretation machines so if i teach and somebody is in in and the students in the classroom raise their eyebrow or they look outside i don't see them 
uh, I don't see anyone raising their eyebrow or looking outside, but I see someone who is doubting what I'm saying or is um, is bored, right? So I'm 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 instantly perceiving my my interpretation, and what we in our uh, in our study studies try to do is see what kind of behaviors underlie those interpretations and it's very hard because this, these interpretations are almost instantaneous and very very automatic so i i always compare it in in my classes with my partner I went to art school she's a painter uh, and when she, she's a, of course she's a very good painter i'm a very poor painter and uh, my analysis of this is that when i try to for example draw a dog i try to I try to draw my interpretation of the of the of the dog, right? So what's in my mind's eye when I perceive of a dog? Yeah. But what what she does is she is uh, drawing the light and the impulses that sort of cause you to see this dog, right? And you have all kinds of 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 little tricks to achieve this. You can look through your eyelashes, or you can hold up a pencil and look along the pencil. So you 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 need to be able to see the raw materials that give rise to the interpretation and and that's very difficult in uh, in interaction to to not see someone doing a request but someone just uttering words at a certain speech rate in a specific loudness in a specific pitch with specific gestures with a specific gaze and that that takes a lot of uh well getting used to <laughs> Yeah, this is. I like this ana uh, analog with painting. Um, that your folk uh, with with language because we're. I think when then when there are, are misunderstandings or arguments or something like that, a lot of it has to do. Like you say, you think something in your head, uh, or you want something, or you you say something, and then arguments are like, yeah, but I already said that, or so it's from. Uh, I have an idea and I'm going to put that into words. And, and most of the times I would say that works probably, um, but we rely on it a lot. And the analog with painting is that you're speaking to somebody who's listening to you. So you're speaking to a listener. And of course, there's you can speak by yourself in a room, but then you're the own listener. But I think that's one of the insights i got from conversation analysis just in everyday life is that you're speaking into a listening so to speak and and that can be very different if it's if it's your wife or if it's a, a classroom mm -hmm. or if it's a stranger on the street and depending on who you have before you you can use different words and um yeah did you have this this strangeness uh like making something very familiar, the most everyday stuff, making that strange. Is that what you had all your life already, or at least since you were watching these football games, or is that something that you discovered yourself? No, I I, I, I think that's something you, you some, someone, so, so I, I think I had an interest in human interaction yeah. and, and that language played a role, but sort of it, it's it's also very strange to realize that sort of the things that i'm now talking about or that we are talking about uh were really developed only in the 60s of the of the last century right so before that language was very well you had other people like Bühler and jacobson but language was primarily seen as something to describe the world as information, as uh, as knowledge, as true or false, but see, perceive language as uh, as action, and see the the indirect relation between the signs that we transmit and the very rich interpretations that we that we build is is, is apparently very difficult to see, and only in the sixties of the last century people really discovered that or rediscovered that and build on this and, and made these wonderful theories like people like Grice and and, and Austin and um, and Searle and Harvey Sachs and um, so it, you really need to uh, to get back to your question you really need someone I guess to to point this out to you so uh, when you uh, when you point this out in a classroom uh, then well 
people's eyes light up and they 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 well they they really rediscover this insight that maybe they had earlier before and for me it was the same thing so this was something i uh i got acquainted with uh through teaching so the teach i just stumbled into some great teachers when i was a student and uh they encouraged me and uh lent me books <laughs> pointed me in the right direction <laughs> so that's um, I think what, that's what a... were some of those ideas when i did my studies it was uh was of course a long time ago and uh so the the relevance book by sperber and wilson was new by then and it really builds on this fact that you that the meaning isn't the whole meaning isn't in the in the words so the yeah. uh, the words are a recipe or a blueprint and they have their own conventionalized system and it exists as sort of a population level phenomenon and it sort of provides the basic building blocks for for meaning but then you need to add to this using all kinds of cultural relational knowledge to get to the the full interpretation uh, full interpretation of that and uh, that really really spoke to me and that's actually quite a sort of a cognitive approach right for so so you enhance this meaning based on on relevance and then but uh, so, so long... just sorry just to to pause there i think in podcasts they say uh, let's unpack this a little. okay <laughs> <laughs> um so what happens if you only focus on the words like the let's say the words contain the meaning like a table contains the meaning of a table. What what happens if you ignore this part about the culture and the context that you're in? Well, you 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 miss the real uh, the the real function of uh, of language in that in that particular in that particular setting, right? And uh, even in what what I'm talking about, so the the relevance book is very much about well they have many dialogues but it's it's about isolated sentences very much right so you have the the grammar and the lexicon which are sort of population level phenomenon that have evolved over time let's sort of say they, they don't exist in uh, individual minds but it's sort of a theoretical construct over the whole population and then of course for me uh, well, Harry Maslon pointed me to in the direction of of conversation analysis and uh, well, the lectures of Harvey Sachs and uh, well, the work by Jefferson and uh, and Pomeranz. And then you realize that uh, well, th th for me at least, uh, the the natural locus of of language is uh, is interaction, right? So, so language before is... there was the the work before relevance is still focusing on while well, we were talking about the meaning of words like the meaning of table mm -hmm. and then the relevance is maybe about already uh the meaning of sentences like the table is over there yeah so the the the, the relevance book tried to answer questions like how do individual sentences in, yeah. in in a particular context sometimes in response to something else get get their meaning but it wasn't really uh, it was a psychological sort of model, and uh, yeah. uh, as a conversation analyst, I'm I'm sort of more focused on language as a as an interaction tool, right? So in dialogue, in conversations, so in response table, to yeah, the table is over there. Could be you need to know what is it? Is this a response to a question? Like where's the table or? Is it some something else? So the unit, like the unit that you're looking in, is more not just an isolated sentence, but the sentence as part of an interaction. Well, yeah, I, I think the most, if you want to sort of contrast the approaches, yeah. So if you look at the sentence in isolation, uh, uh, you you will look at meaning potentials that are that are shared and. Uh, you come up with a, with a situation and a particular meaning, but in in conversation analysis, I think uh, the method is quite quite different in the sense that in conversation analysis, people will not necessarily talk about the meaning of a sentence, but about the interactional meaning that interactants uh, turn by turn 
re realize while while speaking so that's that's one of the questions you can ask right so is there a meaning for for a sentence or is it negotiated and I, of course i think conversation analysis uh and and also relevant but they both will argue that it's of course there is not the meaning of a sentence like my bike is broken means different things in different settings but uh, in conversation analysis people would argue that it's so the 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 eventual meaning of a of a sentence is an or they, they wouldn't call it a sentence but an utterance is it's an interactional accomplishment right so you speak then i in my response show you how i understand your action and then in response to this you can let me know whether this is how you want it to be understood or not right so for example one of the the, the uh one of the examples i give in in class is uh if i ask my well let's take my kids again as an example if i ask my kids just to stay thematically uh, <laughs> coherent uh, so if i ask them um uh, what time will you be home and they will say, well, six o'clock. And I, I can then then say, great, I'll have dinner ready. Then how long, how how late will you be home? You will be maybe call a request for for information, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I can also say, uh, I can if I can also say, well, what time will you be home? And they will say six o'clock. And I can say then, oh, that's okay sort of granting it right and, yeah. and and that will be a different activity right so the same sentence and the whole act and another example from my data from from surgery for example if 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 a supervisor says well you you have to clean that really carefully and then the, the resident so the, the the learner so to speak says uh oh yeah you're right then they are construing uh a correction right so by his response he is showing and 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 the interactional result is that there has been sort of a change in in behavior caused by the supervisor it but could even be if you would say it in a different way it could be saying oh i knew this already yeah exactly or so something. you could also say well yeah, yeah that, that was was exactly what i was going to do as a next step right ah, so, okay. so yeah so uh but i mean as as the as the trainee you could say that right and then then it wouldn't be a correction so uh or just you are right and then it's just an evaluation or or, or collaboration so there is not there isn't this fixed meaning but uh and that that's actually quite quite nice that's something that also appeals to me when we when we talk about uh communication we often also discuss technology and that's interesting right because we have now all these wonderful technologies that uh well constitute different conversational ecologies to have interactions with each other right so we have uh, whatsapp you have email you have facebook you have tumblr i don't know i'm 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 far from an expert uh in that area but actually when you look at just face-to-face -face interaction that's already uh maybe one of, you could consider that already maybe one of the first pieces of technology that the that the that we as humans came up with right because yeah. we we speak one person at a time at least in our culture you could imagine cultures where it's different and and, and they exist but by talking one turn at a time which which we call the turn-taking system is that provides you with a very powerful procedures to to calibrate meaning and to to constitute this this interactional meaning because uh we assume that we have a lot of shared knowledge but we cannot look into each other's heads so if we want to have something like interactional meaning or common ground or how you want to call it uh, depending on your theoretical uh, background you need you need to calibrate and, and and this whole turn-taking system allows you to do this so you speak for a very short time and i respond so you know perfectly that what i'm saying is in response to the little bits of behavior that you yeah. did before right and then you can respond to that and it, this this really allows us to to fine-tune this interactional meaning and uh, because this of course uh 
I think this is sort of a puzzle. Uh, so how is it possible to have intentionality as a group? So how are we so successful as a species in collaboration and building all these wonderful things, right? How, how do we do this? And, and one of the things, one of the answers you might give is, well, shared knowledge. And uh, then you, uh, uh, then you can give different answers into the question, where does this knowledge come from? So you can say, well, it's something we, sh we share beforehand, right? It's something that's part of, and you can say, because we have a personal history, because we come from the same culture or we are in the same setting, right? And for example, people like Clark, those are three types of common grounds that, that Clark distinguishes. And he says, well, you have this common ground and then you have to, ground each and every individual's utterance and then you will come up with the interactional meaning right so uh, you can also look at the meaning as the result of the interaction so not not leading into <laughs> so uh, so the shared knowledge as a sort of not the leading into the interaction but also as a result of the interaction so you negotiate what is happening so you constitute reality uh or it could be a mixture of of the both, right? And that and that's really, I think, an an open question, and 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 gives rise to to very interesting uh, theoretical, but also practical uh, practical questions. So in our field, uh, one of the questions is about uh, action ascription. So how how do you ascribe an action to another person? What kinds of what it, what is that based on? What kind but of just just to take one step back first is that I think I don't think we've said that explicitly yet. But one of the things that really changed in this uh, new insights is well the le lecture series of uh, Austin was how to do things with words. Mm -hmm. The the insight that you do things with words that if you say hello your greeting if you say something else you're doing something and you're you can use the same words and same sentences in different contexts to get things done if you say i do in the right context you're married <laughs> that's really you know something uh someone we both know just got married and uh it's because of, of um, two words uh, or how do you say it in dutch i think in this particular context it was just yes yes oh uh, one word Boom, you're married. Set under the right, right circumstances, you're married. Um, so, yeah, just so to go a little bit back. So this is uh, a very simple thing. And I, I was looking back, like, when did this insight emerge? And I found this uh, sentence by uh, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, a philosopher, who said, what we call descriptions are instruments for particular uses. So I think this is when you're describing something and we've been focusing on how do you most accurate, for instance, in science, you focus on how do you most accurately describe the world. Um, but the insight that, yeah, but you're just not, you're, you don't just randomly go around your day describing stuff. You're describing something in a particular context with a particular uh, use. If you say my bike is broken, you could say that's a description, but it's in a particular context and it's an instrument. It's uh, you're doing something with, with the words. And I was also thinking about, okay, just a little bit more further back. It was in another episode about uh, Bernard Stiegler and about techniques uh, who also uses language as a kind of technology, but even biologically, I think this was Leroy Gouran or Simon Don, I'm not sure, who said that one of the starts of human communication was when we started to walk on our feet because this freed our hands and you could look each other in the face and there was this kind of interaction possible between your hands and your face. And I really like this, like when and Harvey Sachs in the 60s, that these very, very basic insights, Harvey Sachs started with insights like, yeah, two people don't usually talk at the same time. What you see is usually one person speaks and then another person speaks. And when you speak, there are natural points of transitions where either another person starts speaking or the same person will continue speaking. 
very basic, uh, yeah, very simple building blocks, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I, th I think. So, so the 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 issue, or at least sort of the the phenomenon, is of course, uh, it it's very 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 broad, and uh, and so a, a lot of things fall under the heading of of, of social interaction or, yeah. or or communication. Right? There's also this wonderful uh, lecture uh, I, I once saw about, for example, uh, eye gaze that stated, well. Eye gaze is only so important in humans because we have uh, our irises and then the white of the eye, whereas for the other great apes, they don't have the white of the eye, so you just have the iris. So you, mm. for a gorilla, for example, it's very hard. You can not, not so readily see where a gorilla is looking okay, because looking it's just... Me or not. Yeah. yeah, but for humans, it's from quite a far distance, you can already uh, see what what people are looking looking at because of the wide of the eye. And then it yeah. becomes functional and uh, because it's ostensive and, and noticeable and people use it, use it to communicate. And um, so just sort of to, uh, to get back to this, uh, well, conversation analysis and pragmatics, for example. Um, so language use is quite, is, is a miracle, right? We don't really know how how it works yet which is always also very very strange right so we we can send people to the moon and we can do all these marvelous stuff uh transplantations etc but we we do not really know how how communication how communication works it really is still a, a puzzle and people have come up with different types of approaches which yields different questions and, and in a sense also different answers right so one of the things we have been talking about is sort of the uh the topic of pragmatics how do how do individual utterances get their meaning in specific situations because it's an empirical fact that the same words can have dif different meanings in uh in different settings right yeah. so you can do uh, an offer in in different ways so there's not one a one to one relationship from an uh, from action to words but there's also another one to one relationship between words and meaning so the same words can have different meanings so the empirical question then is how do we know this how do we solve this right how is how is this possible and then you have um you can have a more cognitive approach to this and say well what type of knowledge do you need to have how do you need to reason to get from the words to the meaning etc right so it, it, those are typical questions that we we would subsume under the heading of of pragmatics and then in conversation analysis we also look at language use and uh, there's there is overlap but um conversation analysis also very much is not interested in in cognitions or or knowledge but is called is interested in procedures that have evolved over time to solve re recurrent problems so how do we solve the problem of one person speaks at a time right so what's the system underlying that when there is a misunderstanding what kind of procedures have we developed to 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 solve that, right? Or to address that. So how do we do repair in, in languages, right? So it's more, <coughs> you take a more of an interactional. What is uh, repair? Well, repair is, is the way how you, are the, the different techniques that uh, uh, a certain culture or a communicative system provides you to solve misunderstandings or yeah fix things in words so not not necessarily misunderstandings but every time every time of sort of redirection of, of speech can also be your own speech right so rephrasing something or changing a word or having trouble finding a word so there are specific we do this and i think that's sort of if you want to look at conference talk about conversation that's i think the basic assumption of co conversation analysis is that when you look at ordinary language, you you might have the impression that it's quite haphazard or coincidental, chaotic, but, con chaotic, yeah. but conversation analysis works from the assumption that uh, that there is a system to 
to the madness, right? Yeah. So there's an underlying system that organizes turn taking, repair, action description, yeah. right? So these I, are. I think that that was also one of Harvey Sack's uh, major insights in the 60s that people were kind of, when they were studying language, they were studying ideal examples, especially philosophers made up examples like, could you pass me the hammer, like as an example? And ordinary language use, like how people speak, like on the phone or how we're speaking now, that was kind of reg regarded as, yeah, but we're we're the scientists in the laboratory and that's just kind of a mess. It's everyday interaction is messy and too messy to study. And he said, I can't remember the phrasing, but I remember we read these, these lectures, these first mm -hmm. lectures of him where he said, yeah, but first you have to see it as an object of study. And to even wonder, is there an order there? And yeah. he started to discovering discover an order in those things that you usually, if you if you do a, a workshop on conversation analysis and you show a piece of everyday interaction, people's reaction is like, "Whoa, do people really speak like that? They don't finish sentences. They, you know, all these kind of things. I'm doing it right now, probably." <laughs> But um, yeah, just this insight that, okay, there is actually order on all levels. There are rules. Rules is maybe also a difficult word, but for if you, if someone asks you, do you want to come to my party? You have maybe three options. And if you say no, if you say yes, you, resp you say, yeah, please. But if you say no, you don't say instantly no. Uh, if you, do you want to come to my party? No. Uh, that sounds very rude if you say, do you want to come my, to my party? Um, well, no, because, and then you must give an account. But if you say yes, you don't anyway. Yeah, uh, so I, th I think that's very, uh, so there is a system underlying all this, this system we do, do not know, this system we, we learn as uh, as we become competent users of some sort of interactional order. And you learn them very implicitly because we don't know the rules, right? It's like you just yeah. you just learn them. And uh, this whole system has a very normative uh, is very normative in a sense, in the sense that uh, everything is interpreted in a normative way. So if you, for example, invite someone for a party, do you want to come to my house tomorrow to have drinks? And there is a pause. Then you're going to interpret this as not a pause but as resistance or uh well doubt or whatever right you would say well, or, or do you already have other plans stuff like that so it's very it's very normative and and the the term you used just now accountability sort of covers that right so social reality is about accountability and and it comes in two flavors so you have have the the explicit form of accountability that you for example uh, you promised something and you didn't do and then you have to give an account or you're uh, uh, rejecting an invitation and you have to give an account right I'm, I'm busy or why didn't you put out the garbage well because i blah 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 right so you give reasons and you provide an account so that's the explicit way of accounting but there's also the implicit way of accounting that that sort of important in conversation analysis and that is that you have sort of a, a normative moral maybe obligation to behave as an understandable person so, so people need to <laughs> be able to understand so in your behavior you have to encode your actions right so you have to be uh accountable for what you are doing people need to be able to ascribe what you are doing in each and every moment in your life right are you waiting in line or just standing there are you in conversation or just physically co-present all these things you have to negotiate through your actions and in your actions be accountable or be accountable in the ambiguity that you want to constitute for for those actions right and and a nice example is uh, uh for example i uh this is something that happened to me uh 
uh, this time doesn't involve any kids but just at my work i was at uh, in the basement where we where we park our bikes and uh, good that it uh, doesn't involve any kids <laughs> yeah good. very good <laughs> just for uh well diversity sake that's that's good right uh, uh, so i was going up and someone was coming down and and this this person was walking up to me and then suddenly turned around and probably forgot something but then you 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 don't just turn around for, but and and walk back but you make your sudden change of uh of behavior uh intersubjectively uh accountable right you will say will slap your hands to your forehead and say oh i forgot my keys or something along those lines right you will you will make that uh that behavior uh accountable so uh those two types of accountability uh together with the, the normativity of it and the the assumption that this is sort of uh systematic that there are evolved procedures to ensure this accountability uh, underlie a lot of of conversation analysis yeah yeah, I was just thinking, well, we should get to Plato's cave uh, soon as well. And then maybe some concrete examples of how you use this in your research. But I was just thinking how, why, why do, because I am interdisciplinary scientist. So I, I really like many different sciences, but I really love conversation analysis. And, and why, why is that? And I think one answer is, is if you have this perspective, uh, nothing is ever boring. You can enjoy just the most basic interactions. You can see, oh yeah, I see what you're doing there or interviews or something like that. When you were speaking earlier about you were interested as, as a child in interaction, I think maybe there's like a split. Uh, some people become uh, linguists and the other become comedians because comedians are always also looking at everyday interactions and of course, exploiting a lot of these things like uh that that we've been talking about yeah so in well like series like like seinfeld or the big bang theory or uh uh curb your enthusiasm or or, or, the, or the funny pages garfield Snoo snoopy that 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 kind of they all play with these uh, a lot of jokes also resolve around well, play with these principles, right? Because apparently that appeals to us in a in a very. Uh, but it's because that's that's sort of uh, it is very important to us, and that's also why I, what what I additionally like of like about CA research it's that uh, so you you don't have you don't want to go too far in that direction, but sort of. Uh, uh, we use language to constitute to constitute our social reality in a way, right? So there is a, already a social reality, and uh, so it's 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 new for, for for another first time, I think Garfunkel Finkel says. And uh, but you use language to constitute uh, social reality. You use language to constitute relationships, right? A different type of relationship involves a different type of speaking and uh, we also constitute institutions in our language so we constitute education through th through talk through interactions with pupils and uh, and a teacher uh, we constitute our law sy judicial system law through talk but what and, are and you allowed to say? What are you not allowed to say? Uh, exactly, there's a lot also, of free speech, everything. Yeah, yeah, but also the 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 type of categories that you evoke, right? So you uh, you really constitute things like being a friend, <laughs> uh, my friend John, or is is something that you achieve by talking about that person in a particular way we don't have access to your brain right so you, you, we don't know what you think but in the way you treat him you constitute the category the category friend or uh, i always uh, think of this like conversation analysis feels sometimes like you're in a train or in public transport you overhear a conversation between two people that you cannot see and just after 
a few seconds, you probably have an idea about, oh, these are probably mother and daughter or their friends or their colleagues. Yeah, so that goes back also to the accountability. So the moment you step outside uh, into the social world, but also you don't have to step outside. This also holds indoors. But <laughs> so <laughs> once, once you, uh, well, for example, if we were going to... Uh, to have a stroll in the park, we, we would sort of define, constitute, or make our relationship to each other accountable for the outside world, right? The, the type of relationship we're in, uh, uh, that we are actually walking together and not coincidentally uh, in the same path, right? So the, you constitute that in an accountable way for others to see, <laughs> to to colleagues walking in the park rather than uh, to lovers walking in the park or uh, to family members walking in the park, right? So you do you do that through through actions, and uh, and that's sort of to me is sort of important because I think in our society, uh, so the importance of language and the importance of the arts is very. Uh, very often overlooked, whereas there are these big institutions like education, health, our jobs, our families that we constitute through through language. And very often you hear people say, "Well, it doesn't matter how you say it, as long as you as you understand me." But I think one of the basic insights of of CA that that, that isn't true, right? <laughs> so it's how you understand someone it has everything to do with how you say something, right? So the, these formulations and uh, your actions matter in how you are, how you are under understood, and you need to you need to study that to to understand the consequentiality of language in your society. So there's that's why I also like to work with these medical professionals who are always very eager to learn and to optimize their professional practice. So there's this best pra sort of nice example in our uh, in our uh, in our field uh, between the difference between uh, anything and something, right? So uh, and it's a good example of how uh, how this works. So at a certain point, people found out that uh, that not all complaints that people have coming to a consultation with a doctor are actually addressed in um, in a consultation, and that's a problem, right? Because you need to have maximum information to have the right diagnosis and the right treatment recommendation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they then uh, advised doctors, or taught doctors, or instructed doctors to. Uh, to ask at the end of the consultation whether there were things that hadn't been discussed that needed to be addressed, right? Additional complaints. Uh, so that's an instruction. But then all these medical professionals, they go to their own private consultation rooms and find their own solutions for this recurrent problem, right? And some, some of them ask, is there something else I can help you with? Or is there anything else I can help you with? So the difference being something else and anything else, right? And you, well, might then say, well, who cares? It's just a word. Why is it important? But they were actually, and, and that's very clever. They were, uh, they they were capable of showing that it did matter because they then would they they set up this experimental context where they would ask patients uh, to list all their complaints that they wanted to talk about. And then they would send one half to a something doctor and one half to an anything doctor. And then they would record the interactions and just, well, see how many of these uh, complaints were actually addressed in the consultations. And then it it turned out that one of the conditions were, were was was actually quite quite a bit better. And uh, well, listeners can pause the recording now and <laughs> figure out for <laughs> which, one? What they, <laughs> which one. If, but if was... you're out of time as a doctor, which question should you ask? And if you're yeah. actually want, yeah, interested exactly. to hear more, what, what should you ask something or anything? Yeah. So it turned out that the something condition was, was actually quite, quite, quite a bit better. So in the sense that, that more of these complaints were, were then, uh, proffered and 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 address and the funny thing is uh and then afterwards you can of course explain this and say well yeah of course anything is a negative polarity marker or what have you but i i've i've asked this question to 
numerous uh, student audiences and it's always sort of half half 50 percent think something 50 percent so you need to study it you need to really look what happens in reality and you have to take these uh well you, you have to take language uh seriously not just on a content level but as a on a practice level as an action yeah. as, a, as a specific way of doing things to achieve particular ends yeah, that's one of the so and in order to do that, we have to unlearn some things like in the while well, we do data sessions in conversation analysis, which is a group of people looking at usually it's just maybe a few minutes or even one minute of interaction, which could be anything could be conversation between uh, two friends or something. And one of the most difficult things is that you cannot say things like, oh, she wants this or that someone will say, well, where how do you how can you see what she wants yeah so th th that uh so the data session i think from the origin of ca has been a very powerful tool to to train observations but also to make to make observations because from the start uh you cannot tell what are the relevant uh relevant features of talk and interaction right so you really have to look at a lot of data to inductively from the data itself uh get at those those particular features so it's not something that you first formulate as a theory and then test or look for in the data you really try to build the theory from the observations and 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 the second thing that you said is also important once you have this observation, you try to link it back to observable phenomenon. So it, it's very empirical. So you need to get back to visible signs, right? So the, what, are, what are they actually doing? Uh, what are they actually saying? How are they, how are they achieving this with what types of lexical items, pauses, speech rate, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's interesting because there again, also, there is a, a technology played a role, right? So uh, interactions are ephemeral, so there you speak and and it's gone. So it's difficult to study, and it's no coincidence that CA blossomed or was developed uh, in the time of the the cassette recorder, right? So suddenly it was a, you 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 could pretty easily record mundane conversations, and so. CA was developed on a, on a corpus of telephone conversations and, and, and dinner conversations that were recorded with cassettes and later videotapes introduced, uh, well, the whole body into the interaction for yeah. it. And then, and That's now when people started to realize that, that, uh, well, what you said a few times embodied already. Meaning it's not just about the voice, but also where do you sit? Uh, where do you look? Uh, how do you hold your body? All that stuff. Yeah. And, and in that sense, that's something I also tell my students. In that sense, we are living in uh, in very interesting times because with the technological advancement, it's very easy to record almost anything in a cheap and 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 quick way right so uh, uh i i expect that the conversation analysis will really continue to grow also b based on this uh on these additional ways that we have to gather data or you can combine it with eye tracking or you can combine it with 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 what have you right and uh, so in that sense uh, I think we also are uh, living in interesting times and I think people will, I think we really have scratched the surface of how interaction, social interaction is constituted. Yeah, which is pretty amazing because we've been doing it for a long time already. Yes. Socially, <laughs> socially interacting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've covered already a lot of things that could be relevant to Plato's allegory of the cave. What is for you the most relevant way to look at it? Yeah, I, I don't know whether I have anything sort of def definitive to, to, to say about that. But uh, for, for me, uh, well, almost everything that we, we spoke about is sort of uh, 
linked to this if you if you take the 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 cave as uh as a metaphor for uh well you you see the reflection of something that is that is sort of behind you you don't see the real thing uh but you only see the reflection the reflection of it uh i think a lot of what we talked about you could sort of interpret along those lines so if we if we talk about meaning or uh or thought or in this intersubjective understanding it's very uh, very interesting to to ask where does it reside so where is it right so uh it's clearly not in the words right but the words <laughs> the words is what we see the words is what we hear uh the the visible signs are 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 what we uh, what we hear, feel, touch, smell, etc. Right. So, so that's the reflection. <laughs> so that's the visible, visible side of it. Right. And we try to uh, try to reason and come to sort of an intersubjective understanding based of these of these visible visible signs. And uh, I think, yeah, based then dependent on your theoretical background you're actually claiming that there's something behind you or not right and that there's only the reflection so uh i think some people will say well yeah there there's quite a bit behind you and that's common ground or the knowledge but other people might say well no it's only it's only these visible things that we are uh that we are uh sending to each other and uh whether or not there is something behind you isn't relevant because we have to constitute our meaning based on these uh, on these reflections right so maybe and, if you're if you're too busy with what's behind you what's behind language uh you could use that time and energy to focus on what is actually going on <laughs> uh, what is actually happening in what i can see yeah i i think i i uh i i think i've also worked in both sort of i, I want to maybe stay a little bit agnostic on 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 what the what the right way to do this is but uh what i do think is that uh that it's important to do when you do your work that you do it in in the in a particular frame right so the, the nice thing about ca research is that uh well uh, you can be agnostic about knowledge and uh, cognitive feelings there as well you can just you don't need to say you're just making the methodological claim that well i'm I'm now going to analyze this as a from the perspective that there is interactional meaning and how is interactional meaning constituted through these evolved procedures of 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 uh, of doing talk in interaction and i'm not allowing me to point to to say stuff like she wants or she thinks or she hopes i'm pretty sure that we think hope <laughs> etc but just making the analysis of the interactional uh uh phenomenon and procedures you're sort of keeping that out of the keeping that out of the the picture right so it, it's a way to to see how far you can come analyzing it in in that that particular way do you have any tips or advice for for people do you need to study conversation analysis to start noticing these things or are there some general things that you can well one one thing is of course that if you're listening to something an interview or a discussion or a conversation you can ask yourself what is this person doing for instance yeah so i think uh you don't necessarily need to do ca to 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 do this but you you find it in poetry as well or in or in novels all the only thing that you need to do is uh uh pay pay attention pay attention yeah <laughs> and uh, pay attention observe and don't uh don't interpret well like i said we are sort of master interpreters so it is very very difficult not to interpret something but you try to force yourself to stay at the observation end of things uh and the attention part of the spectrum rather the interpretation or so i i think that's and i 
I noticed this. So I do trainings for uh, medical professionals, surgeons, etc. And we don't really train them. So we have PhDs in the hospital now who do CA and they are becoming proper conversation analysts. But when we do a training, our goal is not to uh, turn a surgeon into a a conversation analyst it wouldn't be possible in the three hours that we spent. But uh, what you uh, what you try to teach them is a particular way of looking at interaction, right? It's something that you socially construe. You're doing this together, right? So in the turn taking, you are intersubjectively calibrating uh, interactional meaning so what you're doing are actions but you can do them in multiple ways so these multiple ways differ right and then then we run them through some clips where we try to keep forcing them to describe the behavior and then think about the consequences and uh almost every time when you then meet them in a couple of weeks they will say now now i see it everywhere right so you 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 teach them a different way to look at their professional life and not necessarily a conversation analytical way, but uh, a way that is inspired by conversation analysis, something along those, those lines. Well, thank you very much for this conversation. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for listening. Go to livefromplatoscave.com for other episodes.